Okay. <clears throat> Hi, first of all, I want to introduce myself. My name is Bernie Wu. Um, I'm with Memverge, and I want to thank you guys for sticking around for the, the last presentation of the evening. Uh, what I want to do is talk quickly about software-defined memory uh, and how, how we've started to integrate it with uh, Loki uh, to run big memory workloads. Uh, I'm going to repeat this presentation tomorrow at 9.40, and actually, I, since I have a little bit more time, I'll actually talk about, I have some more material to cover also uh, for tomorrow. Uh, very quickly, our company is uh, started in 2017. It's based in uh, San Jose, California, and the three founders came from Caltech, and uh, we're currently a Series B uh, company, and we have strategic investors there, as you can see. Uh, and what we're about is breaking down this, uh, since we're here in Berlin, I figure I'll use this symbol here, but we're here to help break down the memory wall and free memory bound applications. And, uh, <clears throat> and what I mean by that is that memory capacity and bandwidth haven't kept up, uh, especially with uh, HPC and AI ML applications. And uh, the DDR bandwidth that's on a typical server also hasn't kept up with the, the core count. So if you look at that, that's been going the wrong direction also. Uh, and then also the, the other trend you see is that compute's becoming more diversified. There's, there's GPUs, there's TPUs, there's DPUs, CPUs, FPGAs, uh, there's a lot of accelerators. Uh, memory's becoming more diversified as you'll see in, uh, in my next slide. And there's, uh, in the second half of this year, there's a new class of memory coming out called CXL memory. And uh, that memory will actually be part of the CXL fabric, the initial, instantiations will be running on the local PCIe Gen 5 bus for the newest Intel Sapphire Rapid and AMD Genoa servers. And so over time, with starting with CXL version 1 uh, this year, 1.1 this year, and then late next year and the following CXL 2.0, we will see memory becoming disaggregated from the CPU. So become an independent, what we call first class citizen like storage or, or networking or anything else uh, on, in the data center. And memory itself is getting more complicated. Uh, there's, there's HBM memory now, there's DDR RAM, RAM that's been around for a long time. There's persistent memory that also runs on the DDR bus that's produced by Intel, it's sometimes called Optane memory. And then there's also this uh, CXL memory that'll be introduced later on this year. So to manage all those different tiers, and they all have different latencies and, and, and uh, properties, uh, uh, requires a new, a new layer of software, and that's what uh, Memverge has been working on. Uh, so what we do is we, we create, uh, we do virtualization and auto tiering to help applications transparently consume this memory, this stack of, of different types of memory. And then also we provide data services to allow this, uh, your application to become more mobile, even with this memory stack. So just to give you an idea what our platform looks like, our, our software platform, we run in user space <coughs> above the Linux, you know, in the, in the Linux user space, directly below these applications shown in orange. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about those applications. And what we do is uh, we first, we virtualize the memory below us uh, and, and create memory pools. Uh, so in many ways, this is similar to software-defined storage, except this is, think of this in a memory context. And then we do automatic intelligent auto tiering. So we profile the applications that are assigned to us uh, uh, and uh, automatically promote, demote hot and cold pages, uh, memory pages. And then, uh, and, th and the key thing is we deliver all this transparently to the application. So a lot of HPC applications are working with they were written in the 1970s. We don't change a bit of them, <laughs> and we can still run them, and run them better, actually. We also implemented something called a memory snapshot that does a copy on write uh, snapshot and also captures the machine state. So this allows us to do a rollback of an application or a cloning of this application and actually move it to, even to another system. So this could be useful for, for uh, operators that need to uh, do some sort of maintenance and things like that. It also gives us higher mobility and the ability to do what we call a transparent checkpoint and restarting of applications. We've also spent a lot of time working uh, with some of the outside orchestration tools. Uh, we have Ansible, we have Slurm, LSF, UGE. We've integrated with various storage uh, 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 APIs for snapshot coordination on AWS, Azure, and, and now Loki. 
These are some examples of data intensive use cases. I'll go through these in more detail. These are ones that we've already been working on. Uh, our, our, our forte of, of these, quite honestly, the, the one we've done the most work on is genomics. We just won the Best of Show Award uh, a month ago at the BioIT conference. Uh, but we also are doing things in EDA, uh, AI, ML, media and entertainment when it comes to simulation and rendering uh, with things like Blender and Houdini, HPC modeling, uh, financial services, uh, uh, and in-memory databases. And then uh, now I think there's an opportunity to work with you folks here in the cloud to do things like increase dens density of virtual machines, containers, lower costs, lower ener reduce energy costs as well, and then also help HPC workloads run better on, on, on these kind of uh, OpenStack clouds. So I'll, I'll go through some of the quick examples of these use cases. Uh, this is an example here of, uh, of comparing uh, MySQL running on a KVM in a KVM uh, virtual machine and we're running Sysbench, looking at the queries per second. This first column here is 128 gigabytes of DRAM. So it's 100% DRAM. And then these other columns are just mixtures of DRAM and persistent memory. And by varying the ratios, uh, we, you can see uh, nearly the same performance. Uh, uh, this, is the, the, this second column here is 100% PMEM. So that's the worst case situation with persistent memory versus DRAM. So persistent memory typically maybe uh, on the read cycle, maybe uh, three times slower than DRAM. So you're seeing that in this benchmark. Uh, but if you use blends of it and we are, our auto tiering algorithms, we can pretty much mask the performance difference. Uh, and then also uh, another example of a use case that we have uh, <coughs> outlined with our memory uh, machine architecture is again, this, this problem of crash systems crashing. So the bigger the memory, uh, uh, the bigger the memory, the longer it takes to rewarm the memory if something crashes. And so our in-memory snapshot really uh, drastically improves that uh, what we call recovery time, recovery point objective, uh, because we can take the memory snapshot and then asynchronously either store it in persistent memory or asynchronously dump it to uh, something like an object storage for, for safekeeping. And uh, that is much faster than other conventional ways of checkpointing uh, applications where we have to serialize and deserialize the memory and it takes, it takes a long time. Uh, so this is an example here with a Redis database, 300 million keys. Normally to drain this thing out of memory, our, our normal uh, uh, serialization process takes 15 minutes. Uh, if you just dump it to persistent memory, we could do it in half a second. Another use case that we have is in genomics, as I mentioned. So a lot of times in genomics, there's, there's a highly iterative process. And so there's, there's calibration going on. And so a lot of times there's, we're showing that iteration here, stage 3A, 3B, 3C. Uh, and, and a lot of times these applications were written as, as single threaded pipeline architectures. And what we've been able to do in some of these cases is parallelize those things by cloning memory snapshots of the application and running them in different, with different parameter settings or calibration settings in parallel. So we can drastically uh, reduce the wall clock time. We also can allow people to do forensics on why, if they had a problem with their application, they could look at intermediate checkpoints. Uh, so these, these checkpoints or, or snapshots can be uh, programmatically implemented. Uh, so if you have something like RStudio or something like that, we can, we can give you an application uh, uh, interface, a programmatic interface where you can insert checkpoints where you are appropriate in your pipeline. So overall, this, what this does is reduce, this was a 12 stage, uh, sorry, 11 stage uh, 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 genomics workflow for, for a cell, uh, for a single cell RNA sequencing. And the blue, the higher these lines, uh, the, the worse the performance is. So the lower, the better. Those are in, in seconds. So bottom line is you can see for each stage how much we improved the uh, execution time or runtime. And overall, we, we reduced this runtime by 60% using our, our uh, memory tiered operations with, with using uh, Intel Optane. Uh, same with rollback. As I mentioned earlier, rollback is extremely fast using uh, our, our persistent memory to store the snapshots. 
So I think we've discovered at Memberge what we consider to be a killer application for persistent memory, which is to store uh, memory snapshots. And you can see this drastic reduction. Everything's down to less than a second, basically. Uh, another example is uh, metagenomics research. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, application that is called Metaspace creates a giant uh, graph. Uh, and graphs, uh, it's a de novo, uh, it's a de novo uh, genomics uh, 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 al al alignment exercise. And so the graph can be enormous. It can be 200 times larger than the original input data. And uh, this job takes also 11 days to run, typically. And for the first time, we've been able to run it on a commodity Intel Ice Lake system with six terabytes of DRAM and PMEM. Uh, so that actually, we actually only needed, uh, in this case, actually, we only needed two terabytes. So what we did was we basically created a 20 to 1 ratio of gigabytes to cores on this system. We're able to, for the first time, be able to execute this whole program successfully on a single machine. Uh, so we feel that helps to democratize uh, metagenomic research. And metagenomic research, if you guys don't know, is used to study the human biome, to study uh, soil, agriculture. It's got a lot of broad-reaching uh, applications. Uh, if you want to know more about it, there's a link I I've included down here below. And this is a quote from this paper we're publishing that basically says, you know, that uh, this, is a, this is a good use case. This will, we're giving a talk at the uh, ISMB uh, next week on this. Uh, sorry, next, uh, next month on this. And this is another example with vehicle noise, NASTRAN, which, which was developed space shuttle error. Uh, we've reduced wall clock time by 25% uh, while holding cost equivalent mixture of DRAM and PMEM. And this is a nice tool we have where we can uh, before you even deploy our software, you can profile your applications by, by process ID or whatever. And the green envelope shows you the total memory consumed. The red area shows you the hot memory. So when you look at these two graphs, this obviously this first graph here is not suitable for memory tiering because uh, there's random accesses going all over the place. On the other hand, you look at this application, you can see a lot of this memory is idle. It's not, it's not hot. Uh, and, and this is ideal for a memory tiering uh, use case. So this can help you identify which applications to move to a memory tiered architecture. So now I'd like to quickly talk about Loki and our uh, software-defined memory integration. So the value we see to the Loki community for the operators are increasing VM density and container density, plus memory noise isolation and lower to total cost of op uh, ownership. PMEM is only half the cost of DRAM. Uh, as, uh, to give you an idea, per, uh, cost per gigabyte standpoint. And then also, I think this PMEM also only uses one-tenth the power of DRAM because DRAMs are based on leaky capacitors. And so there's also a sustainability benefit here, carbon footprint benefit. Uh, and then also, I think HPC applications are, can be attracted now to the HPC, uh, to uh, clouds. And then we can also do this off-peak checkpointing. So we do this right now in the public cloud where we, we take snapshots. Uh, applications that weren't fault tolerant can now be run on spot instances in the cloud. We can do the same in the OpenStack community. Uh, and uh, for the users, they, they get to put more of their HPC applications on the, on the cloud, have this checkpointing benefit. Uh, and then also we can do things like bursting and mobility of applications that are memory intensive, in increase the mobility of those things. So this just gives you a quick idea. Again, PMEM at 512 uh, uh, gigabyte uh, 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 sizes is one-tenth the power of DRAM. Uh, and then also, uh, again, densification is possible. So you can cut the total cost, total number of servers down, total number uh, of, 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 uh, of DRAM consumed. And then also here's an example of noisy neighbor. Uh, there's, these are all multiple processes, each with four threads. You can see with the memory machine, we have a very flat profile. These are, these are uh, measuring uh, uh, IOs uh, or memory accesses. So we, we don't have a noisy neighbor problem. Our architecture isolates all the memory objects for each process. And then from a deployment standpoint, there's a multiple ways since we're user space, we can deploy bare metal, we can deploy underneath the KVM hypervisor, which is our current OpenStack integration, and then provide memory services to, to the hosts, uh, the guest VMs. We can run inside 
uh, of a, con uh, we can run inside a C Kubernetes architecture as a container using a Kubernetes operator to deploy, or we can just run in a, in a, in a guest uh, OS uh, inside a virtual machine. So there's a variety of ways to control, deploy the granularity so it only has to be imp implemented on an incremental basis into your data center. We did a quick modification of Mo Nova, we, we can talk about later to get it to, to work on OpenStack, but we want to work with somebody else to bring, it, bring that farther along, make it more automated. And also we're certified with Red Hat, the Kubernetes operator also works with the, the open source uh, versions. So my last ask for you guys is to, to partner with us to help break down the memory wall and help free memory bound applications, especially for this community. And uh, for further reading, uh, I've got a, uh, uh, this is a white paper we published with Intel that uh, talks about us, Kubernetes and containers. Uh, and then this is the metagenomics uh, paper that uh, uh, we'll be delivering a presentation on next month at the uh, ISMB conference on in, uh, computational biology. So with that, I'll stop and I think I'm out of time. <laughs> so, uh, but tomorrow, uh, if you guys come back and want to hear this again at a, at a slower uh, baud rate or whatever, I will talk about another project we're working on called DMTCP, which is uh, for, for MPI-based uh, uh, HPC workloads that allows us to checkpoint across, across an entire synchronous cluster, so. Okay, thank you. All right, I think, I don't know if I can take any questions, but I'll just, um, I'll hang around here for a few minutes. Thank you. <coughs> oh, yeah. How are you getting that data about your applications? Is that a subtle page fault, minor page fault?